My name is Sam Baknin and I'm a columnist in Brussels Morning and today we are going to discuss Prigozhin. Who else? <laughs> Who else? He's all over the news and all over the ground. Did Prigozhin fake his own death? I would have had I been in his shoes. But it seems that another one has bitten the dust, and this time literally. Prigozhin plummeted to his death together with nine of his lieutenants in an exploding private jet, a mere two months after having squared off against Russia's inept and corrupt military establishment, also known as Putin's long arm. <laughs> Prigozhin is only the latest in a long list going back at least two decades. Putin's adversaries meekly surrender their business empires. They die, Berezovsky themselves. They almost die, Navalny. Or they spend the better part of their lives in lethal penal colonies, Khodorkovsky and now Navalny. Russia is frozen in time. Nothing has changed since the days of Peter the Great. Here is an excerpt from the first edition of my book, Putin's Russia, published in 2002. <laughs> That's 20 years, 21 years ago. I've just reread the text and there is very, very little I need to change. So here we go, 2002. Being a KGB officer was always a lucrative and liberating proposition. Access to Western goods, travel to exotic destinations, making new and influential friends, mastering foreign languages and doing some business on the side, often with one's official enemies, so to speak, and unsupervised slush funds. These were all standard perks, even in the 1970s and 1980s. And so when communism was replaced by criminal anarchy, KGB personnel, as well as mobsters, were the best suited to act as entrepreneurs in the new environment. They were well-traveled, well-connected, well-capitalized, polyglot, possessed of management skills, disciplined, armed to the teeth, and ruthless. Far from being sidetracked, the security services rode the gravy train. But never more so than now. Now, in the original text, is 2002. Yeah? January 2002. Putin's dour gaze pierces from every wall in every office. His obese ministers often discover a sudden psychophantic propensity for skiing, a favorite pastime of the athletic president. The praise heaped on him by the servile media, Putin made sure that no other kind of media survives. This praise comes uncomfortably close to a Central Asian personality cult. And yet Putin is not in control of the machinery that brought him to the pinnacle of power, underqualified as he has been. This penumbral apparatus revolves around two pivots, the increasingly fractured and warlord-controlled military, and ever more importantly, the KGB's successors, mainly the FSB. Now, the FSB is the main successor to the KGB. The KGB was succeeded by a host of agencies. The FSB inherited its internal security di uh, directorates. The SVR inherited the KGB's foreign intelligence directorates, and so on. With the ascendance of Vladimir Putin, I'm continuing from the 2002 text. With the ascendance of the Vladimir Putin and his coterie, all former KGB or FSB officers, the security services revealed their hand. They are in control of Russia and always have been. They number now twice as many as the KGB at its apex. Only a few days ago, in 2002, the FSB had indirectly made known its enduring objections to a long-mooted and government-approved railway reform, a purely economic matter. President Putin made December 20th, the day the murderous Cheka, the KGB's ancestor, was established in 1917, a national holiday. But the most significant tectonic shift has been the implosion of the unholy alliance between Russian organized crime and its security forces. The Russian mob served as the KGB's long arm until 1998. 
The KGB often recruited and trained criminals. Atarsky, Atarsky took over from the Interior Ministry, the MVD. Former reserve and active agents joined international or domestic racketeering gangs, sometimes as their leaders. After 1986 and more so after 1991, many KGB members were moved from its bloated first SVR and third directorates to its economic department. They were instructed to dabble in business and banking, sometimes in joint ventures with foreigners. Inevitably, they crossed paths and often collaborated with the Russian Mafia, which, like the FSB, owns shares in privatized firms, residential property, banks, and money laundering facilities. The cooperation with crime lords against corrupt, in other words, uncooperative, bureaucrats, became institutional and all-pervasive under Yeltsin. The KGB is alleged to have spun off a series of ghost departments to deal with global drug dealing, weapon smuggling and sales, white slavery, money counterfeiting, and nuclear material. In a desperate effort at self-preservation, other KGB departments are said to have conducted the illicit sales of raw materials, including tons of precious metals, for hard currency, and the laundering of the proceeds through financial institutions in the West, in Cyprus, Israel, Lebanon, Greece, the USA, Switzerland, and Austria. Specially established corporate shells and banks are used to launder money mainly on the behalf on behalf of the party nomenclatura. All said, the emerging KGB crime cartel has been estimated to own or control around 40% of Russian GDP as early as 1994, having absconded with $100 billion of state assets by 2002 when this text has been written. Under the dual pretext of crime busting and fighting terrorism, the Interior Ministry and the FSB used this period to construct massive parallel armies, militias, better equipped and better trained than the official one. Many, many genuinely retired KGB personnel found work as programmers, entrepreneurs and computer engineers in the Russian private sector and later in the West, often financed by the KGB itself. The KGB came to spawn and dominate the nascent information technology and telecommunications industries in Russia. Add to this former but on add to this former but on reserve duty KGB personnel in banks, high tech corporations, security firms, consultancies and media in the West as well as in joint ventures with foreign firms in Russia, and the security services latter-day role and next big fount of revenue becomes clear, industrial and economic espionage. Russian scholars are already ordered as of last May to submit written reports about all their encounters with foreign colleagues. This is where the FSB began to part ways with crime, albeit hitherto only haltingly. The FSB has established itself both within Russian power structures and in business. What it needs now more than money and clout are legitimacy, respectability, and the access that these bring to Western capital markets, intellectual property, proprietary technology, and management. Having co-opted criminal organizations for its own purposes and having acted criminally themselves, the alphabet soup of security agencies now wish to consolidate their gains and transform themselves into legitimate, globe-spanning business concerns. The robbers' most fervent wish is to become barons. Their erstwhile, less exalted criminal friends are on the way. Expect a bloodbath, a genuine mafia gangland war over territory and spoils. The result is by no means guaranteed. This was written in 2002. Plus a change.